It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here again. Um, as I said this morning, I'd, I'd have a chance today to tell you a little bit more about uh, systems engineering as we look to the future. Uh, for those who were in the session with uh, Paul Schronemacher, you saw some preview of so some of the messages we have. But um, So today I want to look at digital engineering as an enabler for the future of systems engineering. And with that, okay, all right, seems we're fine now. All right, so the, um, what I'd like to cover today is, is uh, looking at the evolution of the systems uh, engineering environment, the need for change, some challenges uh, from digital engineering, and what Encozy is doing to make a difference. So, um, so let me start by asking a question. Is MBSC or digital engineering the solution for the future of systems engineering? How many people say yes? It, it, is, the, it is the solution for the future? Okay, I saw most of the hands down. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming that's for the reasons that, that I'm thinking, which is um, we can we can digitize anything. We could digitize the pra practices we've done in the past or we can digitize the things we're doing in the future, right? So what keeps us from putting in place a digital engineering environment and MBSE that applies to poor, outdated practices? Okay, so, so we need to look at more than just the digital engineering. But on the other hand, as we've heard a number of people say so far today, that um, the, we do need the MBSC and the digital engineering in order to enable what we're doing in the future, to be able to handle the amount of data, the kinds of things that we need to do. So I want to first start with, with uh, setting the stage with the evolution of our systems environment and some uh, observed trends. So what you see here is uh, are th three studies that looked at the relevancy of systems engineering. The one on your left-hand side came out of the Systems Engineering Institute in, in conjunction with the IEEE and COSI and NDIA. And it was looking at our practices and how they contribute to the success of programs. And what you see there is when you look down at how they classified the practices, that it, it was uh, basically a very strong correlation between uh, doing the systems engineering activities and the success of programs. The only thing you see on the negative side is the, that there's a negative correlation between program challenge, meaning how hard is the program, how difficult is it, versus the success. The two on the right-hand side are studies that were done in two different decades, collecting data, one from NASA, one from Eric Honor, that was looking at the uh, application of systems engineering to the cost of the programs and the overrun and such. And we saw some significant correlation also there with the uh, application of systems engineering versus the program success. Okay. So that was relevancy on how we did systems engineering in the past, meeting the needs of the past. But what we're seeing now is that the uh, environment is changing faster than our practices. So what we see is that um, we're facing more dynamic environment with increasing levels of complexity, need for cybersecurity, uh, more inter interoperability and interconnections, and we're, we're having a hard time moving as fast as the technology is changing. Okay, so I want to look at three trends. So the first one is complexity. All right, and this, this chart's right out of our uh, uh, SE 2025 vision. And it looks at that the complexity of our systems continues to increase Okay, and we don't expect that to change. The functionality is increasing exponentially while we're also seeing that the systems are more highly interconnected with more, more uh, components. All right, so th um, how many of you have uh, one of these? A smartphone, 
Raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay, better question. Raise your hand if you don't have a smartphone. All right. I mean, they, they've, they've been, become pretty much ubiquitous, right? So we rely on these. Now, why am I uh, talking about a smartphone? And that's because think of the, this smartphone. Mine might not be as smart as yours. But um, versus the PC that you had back in uh, 80s or 90s. Okay, which has more capability? Smartphone, right? Okay, in fact, it's got many, many, many times more uh, uh, capacity and, and ability to do things. So what we also see is that it is connected to everything, whereas our PC of the uh, 80s was standalone. Okay, so what we see is the complexity of our systems continues to, to, to increase. We had a, uh, a speaker at the um, International Symposium just this past July in, in D.C., uh, Langdon Morris. And, uh, and he talked about the smartphone versus the first supercomputer, which has more capacity, capability. Smartphone, by a thousand times. Okay, so... That's pretty amazing, really, when you think about it. Okay, so the next trend I want to talk about, and I'm going, to, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this one, is the increasing rate of technology adoption. I'm going to spend time on this because I think this is one of the things that is right now forcing us to have to think differently. Think about systems engineering in a different manner than we did in the past. Okay, so what you see here is that... Years ago, it was 80 to, to 100 years from the point that technology was put in place before market penetration, all right? In the, in the recent past, it's more like 10 to 30 years, right? But we're actually seeing it now even lower than that, under 10 years in many cases, all right? So um, what... what the quote that's on the bottom is, is also out of the vision, which says, with technology infusion rates increasing, the pressure of time to market will also increase, yet customers will be expecting improved product functionality, aesthetics, operability, and overall value. Better, faster, cheaper. We want them all. Don't choose two. Okay, so um, let's go back to the smartphone example. All right, so what, the graph that you see on your left-hand side shows the landlines and how long it took before penetration. And then it was for the uh, cell phones and then mobile phone, or, or the smartphones. Each one of these taking less and less time. All right, so, but what's really interesting are the other effects that this technology that we start to use has. All right, so this graph is showing the increase in time spent on the internet. Notice the blue bars are those on your PC. Do they change? No. All the increase that we've witnessed up through 2015, because the, the graph only goes up to there, was due to smart mobile devices, your smartphones primarily. All right, so, but we also see that Cisco is, was saying that 70% of the uh, internet traffic, by 2019, 70% of it will be from smart, smart devices. So we continue to see disruption in our technology. We see different changes, impacts from things that previously we hadn't even thought about. All right, as another example, we see autonomy and artificial intelligence coming up everywhere. Has anybody talked about artificial intelligence today? Anybody heard a talk that, that mentioned it? Okay. Ten years ago, we would have sat there and said, maybe I heard somebody talk about it. Now, almost every session, you're going you're gonna to hear something about autonomy or artificial intelligence. All right, and we see it just about everywhere. All right, and so we know that we're embedding it in our systems already. We're seeing driverless cars being tested everywhere. Uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, about a year and a half ago, Uber put out 100, 100 vehicles to, to uh, try and prove that they could have driverless cars. Uh, del deliveries, if we think of Amazon, we think of what? Drones, right. 
drones. We all think about that image of the drone coming and dropping the package off right on our doorstep. All right? Hope it was a birthday present. Okay, so, but actually Amazon's looking at every kind of autonomous delivery. They're looking at trains, they're looking at uh, ships, they're looking at everything. Uh, okay, and we're seeing others doing it. Um, hotels, we see reception, where we have robotics as, as uh, robots as re uh, reception. Uh, maybe you didn't have it here, but in Japan it's not all that uncommon, and, or deliveries to your room because of it. Uh, and I'll go through some of these others. I have some examples to show in, in some of the videos. But in addition to the positive things, we also have to understand what the challenges and unintended consequences are of this and be ready as systems engineers to deal with these things. What we weren't intending in terms of the effect of the, the technologies, what we weren't expecting to have uh, uh, happen, we need to be able to deal with. All right. So uh, here's an example of, of that shortened time to market. All right. Now, I won't say that we're to market penetration yet. But notice in 2007 that uh, we were at a point where DARPA was having an um, uh, urban challenge for autonomous vehicles. And look at all the contraptions hooked onto that car to be able to do autonomous driving, right? But then look seven years later at the, uh, the Cadillac that was doing more than what that urban challenge car was doing, right? And that was considered the holy grail of autonomous vehicles at the time. But um, I was in 2017 taking a, uh, a, a lift from, the, um, from Reading, UK to the airport uh, Heathrow. And up comes a Tesla. You know, the kind, the really neat ones where the doors come up and you go, oh my God, I wish I had that car. Right. And uh, we, we just get started and the, and the drivers, they're like this. Okay, so he's begging for me to ask, you know, is this an autonomous vehicle and, and ask him more about it. And sure enough, though, we went the entire way without him touching the steering wheel. We passed cars, it would come up, slow down, go around then pick back up to the speed it was set on, no problems, okay? Only time he had to touch the wheel was when we parked, okay? So it's come a long way. Um, okay, so from autonomy, we can get a whole lot of really neat things come out of it, okay? It improves uh, productivity because you don't have uh, the kind of defects that are created. You can have very consistent manufacturing that goes over and over repeatedly. Uh, we can operate continuously because the machines don't need to sleep. Right? We only need to worry about maintenance for them. Uh, we can have uh, uh, much more information sharing because we can send out the sensors in all different directions and, and then handle all the volumes of data that come in. You can see in the one picture there is from, uh, it has Watson. And, um, and then, uh, of course, we, they can go uh, where otherwise we couldn't send people safely. I should also point out the, the credit for the, the, this set of charts came from a keynote speaker we had at, um, uh, two years ago in um, uh, Australia for our uh, symposium, which is Paul Nielsen from the SEI. And he did a really nice job of, uh, of, of uh, presenting there. I just wanted to take the concept, though, and, and take it as far as not only do we also have these effects of autonomy that are positive, but we also have to be able to deal with the issues that come from it, one of which we're going to have change, okay? Because as we see these systems able to do things, and put them together in different ways. There will be emergent behavior. We will have that continuous change. The boundary between man and machine will change. So how, how we deal with those, we need to be able to, to, to account for, say, changes in people's jobs. Um, and, and building trust in systems because how we do VNV will be different. If you have a system that is learning and changes, is it any, is, can you say it's validated and verified anymore? Or do you need to do something more? Okay, it depends, right? 
um, and the attack vulnerabilities are greater. But the one thing that I think is really worth pointing out on this list, and I won't go through them all, is the unintended changes to other businesses. Much like we, we pointed out from the smartphone with the internet. But in, uh, there was an um, article in IEEE System Man and Cybernetics that Bill Rouse wrote, and it's, it's a short article, but it is really well written. And it hits home, because it talks about, from the driverless vehicles, all the kinds of changes you would expect. Things, some of them are, are the ones you would, you would first think of, like, okay, you may have changes in jobs because uh, taxi drivers may eventually not be necessary, or people who, who drive those delivery trucks. Um, but there were some very interesting ones, too. That, uh, okay, if I've got a whole f uh, 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 population with driverless vehicles that are intercommunicating, how many, uh, how many accidents would there be? Probably a whole lot less, right? Because they'll inter the, you'll have that communication between them. And we're uh, talking about when, when the uh, bugs are all out of this stuff. And so, therefore, insurance companies that make a lot of their money from auto insurance will have to look at different business uh, plans, okay? Uh, but there's an even more interesting one. Where do most of the, or where does a large number of the organ uh, transplants come from, or the organs for organ transplants, the donor programs? Accident. From accidents, okay? And so, if there's less accidents, there's less organs to harvest, right? And so therefore, we're going to have a shortage of uh, organs for organ donor programs. So I just found this a fascinating article because it made you think beyond just the positive effects. All right, so um, what I wanted... Uh, okay, so this is just a short example of... And, and this one's actually getting a little bit uh, older, but I think it's still worth showing because what it is is showing that uh, we, we, do, we are to the point where we can have self-learning and self-adaptation. The robot normally would come up to an obstacle and either stop or return to its initial position. But instead here, we've gotten to the point where it can actually do some discovery. So it tries the one table, doesn't move. It tries the next table, and aha, uh -huh. something happened. Now, it captures that information. It changes its plans. It, it adapts to the learned constraints. And as you have probably figured out now, it's going to find its way around the table. Opening found, plans how to get through, and sure enough, it does. Okay, so the reason I show this is, is the fact that it, even though this is very rudimentary, okay, we are to the point where self-learning, self-adaptation can happen. All right, so therefore, we as systems engineers need to be thinking ahead, not waiting until the uh, people who are designing this stuff in, uh, include all of it in, in the systems, and we don't know how to deal with it in the rest of the life cycle. We need to be thinking about it ahead of time, okay? So, um, and we also have cases where now we're starting to see artificial intelligence creating artificial intelligence. A little bit different. Google has just created an AI that is capable of creating its own AI that performs better than anything else made before in its field. This sounds impossible, but it's just happened. In this video, we'll take a look. The AI in question is called Automatic Machine Learning, or AutoML for short. It's the work of a team of researchers at Google Brain. The researchers at Google used reinforcement learning to create AI inception, as described by Google CEO Sundar Pichai. Designing better machine learning models, but today it is really time consuming. It's a painstaking effort of a few engineers and scientists, mainly machine learning PhDs. We want it to be possible for hundreds of thousands of developers to use machine learning. 
So what better way to do this than getting neural nets to design better neural nets? We call this approach AutoML. It's learning to learn. We are already approaching state of the art in standard tasks like CIFAR image recognition. So whenever I spend time with the team and think about neural nets building their own neural nets, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Inception. And I tell them... And you'll never find out what he tells them. <laughs> um, unless you go find the YouTube on that. All right, so there's a part two, though. So I, I just cut out a couple pieces to this that I thought were... were Auto ML may be one of the first examples, but it does set a powerful precedent. Auto ML also makes AI accessible to a wider set of people. As Google puts it, quote, we hope that the larger machine learning community will be able to build on these models to address multitudes of computer vision problems we have not yet imagined. We think that this can inspire new types of neural nets and make it possible for non-experts to create neural nets tailored to their particular needs, allowing machine learning to have a greater impact to everyone, Sounds great. end quote. There are some questions that naturally need to be asked with auto machine learning technology. That is, if it becomes widely used beyond just computer vision. Some of the concerns are as follows. What if a parent AI passes down a mistake or bias to a child? And furthermore, what if the pace of learning of the child AI develops so quickly that us as humans have trouble keeping up and then we can no longer understand what it's even doing? So the, the point being that we have to understand what we're doing and understand in, in addition to the positive impacts, what are some of the unintended consequences? What are the other things we have to think about? So as systems engineers, we need, we need to be looking at that. So um, do we know what we need to in order to manage AI? If you look at some of the, uh, the very popular uh, techies, uh, Elon Musk says, uh, yeah, it, it, autonomy is, is a disruption, certainly, but deep AI is the real risk not uh, automation, and talks about that it, it uh, could be a threat uh, to, to, the, to li the world as we know it. Um, it Wozniak talked about uh, this stuff uh, possibly uh, getting to the point where um, the devices take care of everything for us and eventually think faster than us and get rid of the slow humans. And of course, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, was talking about it possibly being the uh, end of the human race. Now, they're the naysayers, right? There's also people who have other opinions. Uh, I personally like some of the things that uh, Michael Jordan has said, not the basketball player Michael Jordan, but the professor at the University of California, Berkeley. All right? Um, but the, um, you know, I think his is a, a very objective view of it, looking at... First of all, that we have, uh, we're not to the point where it's human imitative. It can't do the reasoning, but it is certainly intelligence augmenting. And so we ought to take advantage of the intelligence augmentation and spend a lot of our energy addressing other things that we need to, like understanding how do we deal with systems of systems. All right, so. Uh, so you've got the positive and negative, but the, the, the uh, best one I have found is the feud between uh, Musk and, and Zuckerberg. To disconnect me. But recently, tech billionaire Elon Musk suggested all that fiction could become reality. I keep so sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like, they don't know how to react. And Musk should know his company Tesla is a world leader in artificial intelligence, or AI. But just like robots, not all tech billionaires think the same. So enter Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. With AI especially, I'm really optimistic. And I think that people who are naysayers and, and kind of try to drum up these doomsday scenarios are... Um, I, I just I don't understand it. I think it's 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 really um, negative, and, and in some ways I actually think it's it's pretty irresponsible. Musk's response: Zuckerberg's understanding of the subject is limited. Ouch. <laughs> now it's important to note that two billionaires have a history. This was Musk's rocket. Inside was Zuckerberg's satellite. So when it comes to AI, Zuckerberg looks at how it can help diagnose diseases and prevent car wrecks. Musk is afraid of the day AI gets smarter than us and we can't turn it off. 
Okay, so, so we certainly have to look at the positives and the negatives and try to balance it out objectively. The third trend and final trend I want to look at is uh, basically the interconnectedness. Okay, we continue to have uh, growth in, in uh, the number of devices connected. In 2000, it was somewhere around half a billion. Uh, today, we're talking about approximately 30 billion. And the prediction is by the end of 2020, it will be about 50 billion. So it's an exponential growth. And you could argue the numbers, but every, uh, every time I've seen this plotted, the curve is the same. It's an exponential curve, and, and I don't see that going away. We all want smart everything. All right? And so... Um, all right. I, all right? And so... Uh, what we also see is, as we get these devices connected into a system of systems, that one system of systems now is connected to others. And so we have systems of systems connected to systems of systems. That is a pretty complex, uh, larger picture to deal with, with an awful lot of dynamics that are not necessarily predictable. All right, so um, I have one last video that I want to show, but this one requires me uh, to get out of this for a second because I don't have it embedded. Um, sorry about that. Okay, and this is dealing with the Internet of Things. A few weeks ago, I went to the grocery store and quickly realized I'd left my shopping list at home. No big deal. Oh. I just pulled out my smartphone fridge app and quickly sorry found my grocery that. list. I, uh... How would you feel if some hacker across the country knew what brand of milk that you buy? Oh, or if you're, you're be really being it. faithful to your paleo diet? <laughs> Probably wouldn't care very much. But what if that hacker were also a thief? And they used your smartphone fridge app to gain access to your entire phone. This actually happened, by the way, through a refrigerator. And they got your Gmail login and password. They started sending spam emails to your family and friends. They got access to all of your apps, online passwords, accounts. They've drained your bank account. And you have no way to regain your privacy. Unfortunately... Okay, I'll just stop it there. So you get, you get the idea is that... Uh, and I apologize for not seeing, seeing the video, at least you, you heard it, and that's really the key, key point there, is that uh, you know, with this whole set of interconnected devices and the way that we bring together all of that information across our smart devices and the Internet of Things to provide basically a hub for all of this information, we do have vulnerabilities, and we have to look at those vulnerabilities. All right, and in fact, uh, both of these are worth you taking a, uh, a few minutes to pull up. Uh, in fact, one person is local here from uh, Ben-Gurion uh, University, and they, uh, I found these two very good in terms of kind of laying out the, yes, there's, there's a positive side of the Internet of Things and the interconnected devices, but there's also some concerns that we need to, to uh, be aware of. Okay, so um, let me go... Back to the presentation then. Okay, so, um, so with this, there's challenges of highly connected systems. One, you just heard, is security. Being able to control the interfaces and the emergent vulnerabilities, those things that, you know, somebody has gotten a hold of your system and now is, is, is ready to hack it. Uh, and the... Um, uh, also, data with privacy. How do you protect the privacy of it? How do we make sure that the data collection and analysis is as we expect it to be and that the data is accurate? Okay, so if you start thinking about that, um, what about I'm driving in my smart car, which is collecting all this information, and if I don't have confidence that the data is going to be used as I expect, collected, and that it's kept private, how do I know that as I was speeding that that information isn't being uh, provided to the insurance company and my insurance is going to go upward to the police and the next thing I know I've got a ticket, right? 
So you need to understand uh, a whole lot of these, the implications of where is that data going. Uh, regulations and standards. When we're talking about uh, these kinds of systems, it's not necessarily by the same boundaries as our countries or our jurisdictions, right? So you need to understand that the policies uh, are not necessarily uh, that where you live, they're going to feel that they, they own uh, or should put in the regulations. And policies seem to or tend to lag technology. All right, and then there's the, all the sustainment issues as well. Um, and, and the thing is, if we're talking interconnected devices, basically we are talking systems of systems. All right, so what, it shouldn't surprise you that some of these bullets look very similar to what we just saw on, on the other chart. Okay, and we've only been talking autonomy and artificial intelligence. And there's a whole list of uh, other technologies here. And whether we look at the industry list here that I've collected or look at this is a chart that came out of the US DOD, they look very similar. All right. And so we need to be able to deal with all of these advanced technologies that we're, we're starting to deal with. So what I want to do now is, is, is look at uh, an overview of the uh, uh, SE Vision 2025 and whether we're uh, ready for the future. Okay, so the uh, Systems Engineering Vision 2025 was uh, published in, in 2000, um, July of 2014, and we uh, basically, today it's still serving us pretty well. Uh, and so it was put in place to try and provide a, a, a way of setting the direction for the future so we could all start to look towards what do we need to be looking at. Uh, it was developed first to align the SE initiatives of you know, at the research methods, processes, tools, uh, and be able to identify capabilities for, that are needed for the future in order to meet our needs to help us be able to identify where we need to make the investments for research and other things. And of course, uh, eventually to broaden the base of practitioners that we need across the engineering domains. Okay, um, at, in there, there's, there's two areas that I'm focusing on here, even though it covers much more than this, is Leveraging technology for SE tools. How are we using the, the technology to help us do systems engineering? You might have heard one person today talk about using artificial intelligence to help us do systems engineering, not just how do we use systems engineering to create systems that use artificial intelligence. So how do we use the technologies to give us that kind of a uh, collaborative environment that it can take advantage of these things to allow us to do better systems engineering. And to be able to tailor and scale the practices for the specific needs of that project that, that you're, you're performing. So in this, we need to transform our practices, things, this is a list that, that comes uh, pretty much if you read through the vision and, and pick out the different ones, things that we need to be able to deal with. Um, it, System of systems engineering. I focus on that quite a bit because can you identify a relevant system today that's not part of a system of systems? And generally I get blank stares because you have a hard time doing that. We used to think of things like, uh, oh, a parking meter. Except nowadays, newer parking meters are made digitally where they're connected into things. It takes your credit card. It, they even will have an app that could tell you when your time's up and so on and so forth, right? So th things have changed. Composable design. We're getting a whole lot of cases where because of the desire for adaptability, can I create things in a way that now I can start to compose them rather than have that reductionist approach. And, uh, and especially based on a few of the things we talked about, needing to design for security. All right, so what does uh, SE look like in, in this environment as we look forward? Well, one thing for sure 
is we will be dealing with change. It's going to be a dynamic environment. We're non-deterministic instead of a, a fully understood deterministic environment. Uh, emergent behavior will happen. Cybersecurity has to be something that's integral to the design that we consider from day one and that we make sure that we can continue to move, uh, move it as the vulnerabilities change. Can't be a bolt on, you know, we're going to put the fence around the system. And uh, for VNV, we're, if, if the system is going to adapt from its learning, that says I've got to have a more continuous type of verification and validation. In some cases, I've heard people talk about it being needs to be built into the system with understanding of when the system has changed and what needs to be, be done. We'll see where that goes. I think there's a, a lot of work to be done in that area. Uh, from a modeling perspective, sure, we're going to continue to build models and, and it's going to become a more important piece of it, but how do we keep the models up to date and valid? If the system is changing, those models need to change also. Otherwise, we're using models that are not reflective of the system. All right, and so that says I need to have a, an ability to very quickly adapt those models. When we start talking about digital twins, think about that. Uh, those have to be able to change as, as the system changes, and I need to be able to validate those. Uh, understanding operational changes, we, we can ex expect that as we see the machine take over more of the roles that maybe some humans were doing, then that says the roles of engagement have changed and we need to, uh, to be able to deal with those changes along the way. And that may then require us to, to continue to educate the workforce. Um, and then we can't expect that technology is not going to continue to change. In fact, we expect it will change at a faster pace. And then with all this comes those governance issues. If I'm dealing with things that are interconnected systems, who owns what? When a change is made, who pays for it if it impacts my system and I, di I didn't necessarily want it to uh, impact my system? All right, so those uh, unintended uses and consequences need to be a consideration. So if we're looking at a digital environment and that's going to enable us to be able to deal with the future, then that says we also have to understand the, the challenges of that digital environment. And so it first says, I've got to change the way I think. I've got to embrace the models as the primary basis of the systems engineering. And that's a culture change. Uh, probably in most of your organizations, there, there are many people who are still pushing back on, on the model-based environments, okay? And uh, I've done this this way for 20 or 30 years, it's good enough. And maybe in some cases it is, all right? And, but uh, we also then have to, in order to, to spark that change, be able to deal with um, uh, making sure that the new approaches at least do what the traditional approach has uh, accomplished. D data needs to be managed as an asset. All right, so and I, I've heard a few people talk about that, so this is probably preaching to the choir at this point. But, um, you know, the models rely on valid data. You can have the best model going, but if the data is bad, the results are going to be bad. So the outcomes are only as good as the data that goes into them, even if you have a fully valid model. And then uh, providing consistent set of artifacts, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the artifacts as we get into the what is Encozy doing. Um, integration, we need to be looking at the integration across many things, across the models, the disciplines, and the uh, in between systems. All right, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that integration level? And it's not just by saying, I'm going to go out and ask the tool vendors to, to connect their, their tools. That's only a piece of it. Uh, and then last, being able to respond to change. So as we, we've talked to in a couple, couple situations already, the environment's changing, the systems are changing, the tools need to change. We need to be able to respond to change, whether it's in the models, whether it's in the uh, stakeholder expectations, or uh, anything else that, that comes out of the, the system. All this leads to being able to trust the models. So we need to be able to do the things that will allow for us to trust, trust the models. This is the 
from to picture. All right, this, this is basically saying we need to be able to get from a stovepiped modeling environment where we look at things all in their individual pieces, where we tend to go by discipline, by, uh, by maybe its uh, function, or by uh, what point in the life cycle it is. And instead come to where we've got an integrated set of models that are sharing a set of data and, and can be representative of the full picture of what we're doing. Okay, so basically evolution is needed. We need to be able to evolve our systems to deal with the future needs, taking advantage of those technologies, but also be able to evolve our systems engineering approaches, the processes, uh, methods, and, and tools, going from a deterministic, linear, predictable perspective to a more non, being able to deal with the non-deterministic, evolutionary, and stochastic uh, perspective. And then last, it only works if we also evolve our people. So we need to be uh, cognizant of all these changes we make, we need to bring the workforce along with us. We need to make sure that the education, the professional development and training are all, all right there with us as we move forward. So we need to be the leaders in enabling this evolution. And as Jack Welch said once, uh, when the rate of external change exceeds the rate of internal change, the end of your business may be in sight. So, well, change that business to systems engineering. We want to stay relevant. We want to add value. We want to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing. And so uh, we need to make sure that our practices stay up with the technology. All right, and so uh, for the remainder of this, I'm going to be looking at what, are, what is Incozy doing to try and make a difference. So the first thing we're realizing is we cannot go this alone. It has to be a community effort. And so we have set up a set of collaborations with, with different organizations to try and help us uh, look at the future in various ways. And so you'll see almost everything that we're doing in these next set of charts, we're reaching out to others and working with them. Okay, and so uh, we've, we've got experience in doing this with the systems engineering standards and practices in the, in the past. And, and we're, we're used to doing that reach out. But it also says, not only with aerospace and defense, but also across the set of domains. All right, so we uh, last, I guess it was January 2018, we, we brought together a number of leaders from, a, uh, from uh, about a dozen different organizations to talk about the future systems engineering. And what can we be doing to be able to to affect change as we look forward. And so you can see the group of collaborating organizations there. Uh, and um, we were able to, uh, well, basically the bottom line was that everybody agreed we need to do something and we need to start to take action. So that was the birth of what we call FUSE, the Future Systems Engineering Initiative. So it's led by Incozy, but it is a community effort. Is, so everything that w will come out of it will be for the entire systems engineering community. Um, uh, Paul Schronemacher's talked a bit about this today. Uh, he's on the core team. And uh, so uh, we've, we've got about uh, eight people will be probably growing it to, to 10 or 12. But there's also a group of community participants that's much larger than that. And uh, what we were able to do this year, so we spent the first year doing an, uh, basically understanding the landscape, where, what's out there, what's being done, where are there gaps, what, what are the priorities, how do we deal with those? And so uh, the objective was to create a roadmap for the evolution of systems engineering. So now we're reaching out to the community. Get involved. Help us to be able to, to, to uh, define what those changes are in looking forward. Uh, and so we, we do have a public website. There's a collaboration portal, a wiki. And um, 
we, we, set a, we defined a set of uh, priority projects. Those start with, uh, there's uh, the systems engineering for artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence for SE. So we need to understand both, using the artificial intelligence and autonomy as basically an example of the kinds of changes that we need to be able to make. Uh, another one is SE Foundations, and that's, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but having a, a firm foundation for systems engineering to be able to build on and grow on. Engagement of the SE community and characterizing the impacts on, on SE. So, um, we're, you know, if you want to participate in this, you can let me know, you can let Paul know, we'll get you... Uh, uh, um, uh, hooked up with, with the right people, but the person who's the leader of this effort is Bill Miller, who was at the, in the box in the bottom uh, uh, of this chart. Okay, in addition to that, we have set systems engineering transformation as an objective for the past few years. So it was, uh, it was identified as one of our, our strategic objectives a few years back, and it was looking at um, uh, three areas, which was infusing uh, um, uh, model-based approaches into what we do in, system, uh, in, in COSI, engaging the external uh, stakeholders in the communication and building what we do uh, externally and work together to advance the practice. So where we stand right now is it appears, we appear to be on track and, uh, uh, as, as we're moving along the uh, roadmap for the five-year plan that was in place. Um, and th this chart, which I won't go through, just gives some of the details. I, I will provide a set of the charts that you can um, uh, access. But the, um, you know, basically, there, there's a lot of work that's been being done. Um, I, I mentioned before about artifacts. And one of the things that uh, we realize is we need a consistent way to be able to communicate uh, in the digital environment across the life cycle. And so we need to understand what are those artifacts that would help us do that communication. What do we expect as outcomes out of the digital engineering work that we're doing? So um, the DOD approached me, and, and we are working with, uh, with the DOD and NDIASC division on, uh, uh, we put together a, a, a joint working group. And others may participate, just because it started from a conversation with the DOD. The intent actually is to, to uh, define, identify and define a set of digital artifacts that are good across the entire industry. And the DOD just wants to make sure that they can then take those and tailor them for their needs. Okay, so um, what's coming out of this project then will be a digital engineering information exchange primer so what are those artifacts? Why are they important? How do you use them? Um, uh, a a uh, system model that, that helps to um, uh, guide the exchange of, of the um, digital artifacts. A set of information models that provide a set of digital views. And then a framework uh, for uh, dealing with those in, in the standards. Okay. Oh, I should mention one thing, and that they're not reinventing the wheel. They're not out to redefine systems engineering. The belief is that what we have in 15288, the, the standard and the handbook, are adequate, and uh, so they're not out to redefine those, but instead define the, um, uh, what needs to be done in terms of the information exchange. We've been working with NAFEMS, which is an uh, international um, organization for modeling and simulation, uh, to establish a, basically, it, it's a trifold that's a top-level primer on uh, what is systems modeling and simulation. Kind of bring, if you're familiar with NAFEMS, they do a lot of the lower-level modeling. Systems engineering is, is a higher level. We're trying to, you know, bring bring those together and in integrate the set of models. And so this is, this is a start of some work that we're doing. And in fact, we'll have a, uh, a joint track with them in uh, the uh, NAFEMS World Congress uh, later this year. Um, patterns, I heard somebody talking about patterns earlier today. And uh, there's work being done to uh, define a set of MBSC uh, patterns that could be used and you know, shared 
a trusted uh, shared set of model-based patterns. The idea is to be able to use these in various projects and be able to uh, gain efficiency and effectiveness. In fact, they've set a goal for themselves of getting to where it's 10 to 1, an order of magnitude simpler, and being able to uh, do, do much more with them. Uh, due to time, I'm going to just uh, go very, very quickly through the remaining things. I said we want to shore up the foundation. In fact, the, uh, uh, the SE vision talks about the need to shore up the systems engineering foundation, providing um, a more disciplined set of principles that may, may also have uh, mathematics uh, applied to those. And so we've been working with a team that came out of uh, NASA, who, some work that they had started and taken that forward to, um, uh, and we're working with uh, a couple other organizations, ISSS and uh, a couple of the universities, to try and uh, establish a set of principles. The team met uh, uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting in December to finalize some work they've been doing to at least put a reviewable draft out. I will say there's still a lot of maturing that's necessary on this, but it's at least the first step to get a, uh, a, a, a set of principles out. There are 15 principles and three hypotheses put together on this. Expect that they'll be uh, available for wide review in the near future. Um, and, and in addition to that, we've also been working on looking at are the definitions for system and systems engineering adequate as we look forward? So we, we tasked our fellows to put a team together to look at the definitions we had and where, we, where things are going. And uh, they came up with, some, with a revised set of definitions for system engineering, an engineered system and system. Okay, and, and so those will be uh, widely released in the near future, but here's the sneak preview of them. Uh, and so these have been uh, reviewed and approved by the board of directors as well. Um, we've been, had a significant involvement in standards, shaping those for, for more than a decade, uh, to include uh, actually about two decades now. Uh, so Incozy's had its hand in on the, the uh, evolution of 15288 and many other systems engineering related standards. Uh, we've got a team that looks at these and it's not just on ISO, looking also across other organizations like OMG, S SAE, uh, IEEE, ASME. In fact, we were approached to work with ASME on one that is dealing with systems engineering for nuclear systems. Okay, um, so one that is of high visibility, especially in the digital engineering world, is with uh, SysML, and we we're working with the OMG team on the version 2, looking at trying to drive uh, uh, more of a focus on interoperability, on uh, visualization, precision, and usability. Okay, uh, for those of you who, who know Dove Dory, he was the, uh, the mind behind the work that was done for the ISO standard for um, OPM, Object Process Methodology. And what's in red there, basically, uh, you can read it. it, it, it it's a, a very straightforward, simple approach to modeling where it's dealing with uh, a, a set of uh, stateful objects and the processes that transform them and our keynote speaker this morning used that in how uh, his presentation went, went through. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, System of Systems is, is a key piece of, of what we're doing with the interconnectedness and we, we put out last year a primer on this of if you're not up on System of Systems is a good place to start. There's other resources we can point you to as well. And last but not least, if we don't keep the workforce growing with us as we're going, we're, we're going to be in a, a, a losing battle. So we've had a, a strong emphasis on professional development and competency. And we look to have a, a um, uh, what I call a comprehensive approach or ca ca capability in professional development. The, uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, you see a, a, uh, an icon or a cover sheet for a, a systems engineering competency framework. 
This was done in coordination or in collaboration with the NDIA and, and several other organizations, DAU uh, and, and such, and uh, it is available for free. If you want a copy of this, go to the Incozy website, go to the Incozy store, and you'll be able to download this for free. And so what we're using this for is many things. We will have an, a, a competency evaluation model that goes with it, uh, but we, we have, um, we're using it as a basis for a portal that we're putting together for professional development. And what we're looking at here is a platform-based environment to allow people to come to collaborate on professional development needs. Okay, that would include those who, who have professional development um, uh, needs that they're looking for to, to, to improve their skills. It also includes those who have things to offer. Okay, so bringing suppliers and consumers together in an environment where they can interact. Okay, and so it also ties into all the other pieces of what we have to offer. So those things that are um, uh, like our Technical Leadership Institute, our certification also does tie, will tie into this. Uh, you name it. It's, it's a potential piece of the puzzle. So during the next year, we expect to uh, have several milestones. I think the most significant is we're looking to have a beta version or uh, the, a releasable version of the minimal, minimum viable product. Uh, so we're doing this incrementally. But the minimum viable product will be uh, released with the, our IS, the symposium in July. So... Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Any questions?